Now, there's callers on the line there. There's Jacob from New York City. Uh, I'll see if he's there. Is, it, is Jacob there? Hey, Alan, how you doing today? Not too bad. Yeah. Listen, my question is, you know, there's so much with the occult as far as, you know, like the EU building being the rebuilt Tower of Babel. And, yeah. you know, it seems to me that, you know, I don't think there's reptilian aliens or anything, man. Yeah. But there does seem to be some sort of overarching doctrine or overarching religion belief. Yes, you're right. Yeah. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? I mean, what, 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 are they, what are they drawing all the inspiration well, it's easy to get inspiration when you when you're selected to a university as a bright young man who will serve them very well and paid handsomely, and you're guaranteed the doors will just open for you, which they do. Uh, so greed is a, a good factor for recruitment. And um, but however, there's definitely a, a religion behind this. Uh, it's very old, and we can go back into ancient Rome, and we can even find traces of it there, with their initiation ceremonies, uh, with with the Equestrian order and so on, and they're very much, uh, they copied almost the same system, or, or either that or, or one copied the other, but it was very similar to the, 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 the Jewish, um, uh, uh, celebrations or, or even systems when they had the tent traveling in the desert idea. The Romans did the same thing with equestrian order. They set up a, a big massive tent, no roof on it. And they had their lit flame and so on, and that's where they initiated their new members. But this was going on across the ancient world, even in Greece as well. So there was a brother who'd already existing in the ancient times who were incredibly wealthy. And they, we can find traces of it through the philosophers who belong to these groups because they talked about the differences between the poor and the rich, uh, the aristocracy and the rest of the public. And some of them, some of them even then, like Plato, tried to rationalize the fact that some children could pick up on mathematics very quickly or geometry and so on because he believed, he says, that he and the elite had lived before. Now, there was a form of reincarnation very much linked to Hinduism. And, um, and the ones who couldn't grasp it well uh, hadn't been born before, so they were a lesser type of being. It was a form of uh, religious classism where they, they class, or racism where they classed you according to had you been born before or not. And, and that was their evident truth because they believed that they knew because of a previous life or whatever. And uh, this this was very popular, this idea, all right up through the brotherhoods that existed, um, through the very rich men who came up through the Middle Ages. You find it breaking out again in, in Rosicrucianism when it first broke out to the general public in France. Uh, same idea, they claimed not only had the riches and could make you wealthy if you served them well, but they would give you life extension because the new sciences. And that's still used today, by the way, in high circles. And you will get life extension. You will be someone like Kissinger or a Brzezinski or, or a Maurice Strong and even Rockefeller himself trotting across the world when you're in your 90s uh, giving lectures. Uh, they don't get arthritis. They don't get old age problems. They don't go see now there's something else given to them. So you're absolutely right. But hold on, we'll get back on that when I come back from this break. Hi, folks. We're back, cutting through the Matrix and talking to Jacob from New York City. Are you still there, Jacob? Yeah, I'm still here. Now, yeah. When I see these guys up there in, you know, like Bohemian Grove, and mm-hmm. they're doing all, you know, the roads and the fire and the out. Yeah. What, I mean, what, what religion is that? What book are they reading from, man? Uh, you'll find... <laughs> You'll find traces of that again in ancient Greece. You'll find it in ancient Rome. You'll find it even in, in the accompanying literature for ancient Judaism, uh, because the, even in Judaism they had they claimed that the the staff that Moses raised in the Valley of the Serpents for, the, for wisdom, the Brotherhood of, of Serpents, was, means wisdom. Those in the no Gnostic, high Gnostic, and uh, uh, that was their symbol. Of, and they brought that back. They claimed. Uh, and eventually into the Holy Land and planted it in a grove. And the high elders would meet there with the, the Levites every year. But eventually they claimed that when the Romans invaded, they destroyed the grove. So uh, these are you, you'll find this uh, in pretty well all the ancient world. The ancient world was not separate, you know. They had commerce and trade and intellectuals traveling back and forth uh, and builders and all the rest of it. So uh, there was a system, much like today's system, um, of commerce, wealth, very much, lots of wealth, 
and trading in slaves and even even depopulation programs, even even programs where they moved whole populations after war out of their land, a very common occurrence, and put them elsewhere. Um, still going on today. Generally, they emigrate now out of the countries we're bombing and to the, the countries that are bombing them. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's really the same techniques, but um, they've gone down through the ages under many names, and uh, the underground stream was one uh, system they called underground stream. That was the gaining of knowledge, keeping of knowledge, never to be shared with the profane. And the, the knowledge really was chemistry and, and uh, other sciences, um, and they said in the Middle Ages, they said that eventually our power will over reach that of kings and queens and governments because they'll come to us for their weaponry. And you might call it a military industrial complex too. Um, but today they brought all their symbology down into the modern sciences as well, especially medicine, etc., with the serpents and so on, uh, the caduceus. Uh, showing there quite simply, and even even the computers too. Apple is, is from the tree of knowledge, you know. Uh, uh, that's why. You know, it's all new what they do, and I've seen like uh, you know, with NASA, and they have like the Apollo space program or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I'm one of those elite guys, do I, you know, know what it's all about? Even without, you know, knowing what it's all about, just through names and symbols and things like that. Oh, they know. They know what it means. They're very careful how they choose them. Of course they are. Because they, they mean uh, uh, elements of the structure of power or arms of power. And each arm of power is, is given a particular name. So they use the, the ancient deities uh, for their speciality. Much the same, again, as if you find in demonology. In, in the Kabbalah, for instance, you'll find uh, certain fallen angels had specific uh, purposes uh, uh, for, for, so you would call them down if you wanted to use them. And it's still done by some sex today. It's the same thing when they, when they use Apollo. And Apollo, again, his symbol was a serpent, uh, as it was Diana's too. And so they use these terms all the time. Even NASA, uh, is an old, old Aramaic word, uh, meaning the head. Uh, so the head or the leader, NASA. And that's why they're like NASA and then even the NSA. If you speak the NSA, it's NASA. It's a similar, similar thing. So they, they're very careful on how they, they use these, these terms and give them names. They've always used the same names all down through history. For, and and the, again, the profane speak them, but they don't know what it means. They think they know what it means, but it, they don't really. Uh, so what they're really telling you is these, these, these terms, when they're used for projects, are theirs. They're in charge of it. It's, it's their project even though you'll be paying for it. <laughs> so they have like their own secret language and whatnot? It's mainly, um, well, actually what it is, is um, a compilation of occult terms and terminologies, uh, c- coupled in a very clever way uh, with, uh, with um, say, philosophy or some of the ancient uh, writers um, uh, of the day that, that wrote plays even. So they'll add things in and use, use these terms in amongst them and they all understand quite quite ably what they're talking about because they, they, they get a classical education. Yeah. Okay, and my, my last question and I'll be done with you. The skull and bones, man. I mean, what, what's the root of all that? The skull and the bones, well, the skull has always been used, right, even from the ancient to the modern times in the high system, the high cults and uh, and the high lodges. Uh, it's always been used as a, a reminder of your own mortality. Because when you join these things, it's not just there to uh, make you uh, aggrandized for yourself. It's also, and you, they'll get, they will aggrandize you. Um, they'll, they'll get you honors and all the rest of it. But it's not just to fill your pockets. You've got a mission to accomplish. And the mission will be the speciality area they put you into. Uh, and that's your mission. So you're a knight on a quest. And the, the skull represents, as I say, the, the basic um, reminder of your own mortality. That's all through Shakespeare as well. And you'll find that symbol all across the whole of Europe. And the crossed bones, uh, again, is a symbol of, uh, it's a symbol of it's actually, on different levels, it's given different meanings. And that, this is what they always do from the lower disciple to the higher one. And the lower ones that always tell you uh, that on, on one hand is crossed. A cross means it's barred. You're barred from entry unless you understand the passwords, the meanings, and so on. 
on the other hand, it means that which carries you. Don't forget that which carries you. Which carries you, what carries you are, is the temples, is the jacket and Boaz crossed together. You see? The two, the two, the left path, the right path working together. And, um, that also was the symbol of the Priori de Zion, which the Pope gave the charter to that became the Knights Templar. And that, that became their, their, their flag for their ships at sea. And that, that's why it was used as a pirate flag, because they became the pirates eventually when they were tossed out of France. And they plundered all the other ships. So it's still used today. You'll see it all over uh, temples and places in Europe, and Britain especially. You'll, you'll see the skull and bones, not just in graveyards, but you'll see it uh, on buildings uh, as a sign of, of uh, where, where the brothers would meet, you know. And is the, uh, what, is the Pope really supposed to be like a fish guy? Like, uh, what's his name? Dogon? Dogon? Yeah, yeah, Dogon was one name for, the, for them. There's a couple of names for them. They, they, they copied it from India, actually. But uh, it's, uh, you're going to understand that they talk about nature. And if you go back into ancient Egypt, you'll find that the Egyptians um, said that, that Ra, Almighty Ra, the god that was behind all gods, and they talk about this today too, that it's a god behind all gods, meaning their god, the one that runs everything. The lower entity that you worship here is basically the Lord of the world, uh, a lower entity. The Greeks were very good at explaining it. He was called the Demiurgos. Anyway, um, the, 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 the Egyptians said uh, that the fish, you know, the fish with symbol was a symbol of life and superior life, virility. And, of course, the Nile was even called happy, uh, and with a god called happy, because all all things came from the water of life. The, the the bank they banked the river and they owned the water and it nourished them, fed them, and gave them life. But the fish was a symbol of it too. And um, they've got a lot of old stories of a guy walking out the water. That's all nonsense and stuff. The, the reality is the fish was a symbol of fertility, with the mouth open to 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 get the water of life, which Ra rained down upon uh, the high priest. Or, or even a pharaoh who sometimes wore it too, because the the water of life was literally uh, the semen, uh, semen actually, <laughs> coming down as rain. That's what they called it. it was the life from the god was, was the water coming down to fertilize the land uh, and give life to everything, life symbolized by the fish. And um, so the mouth is open for it. And even today we use that term, uh, uh, when they when they take oaths to the queen and they sing the anthem, long will she reign over us. Reign is literally they put a slight spelling difference to throw you off. That's what a spell is; it's to throw you off. But it's the same term. She reigns over you. All all the gods' hierarchies reign down on you and over you. So it's a very ancient system that folk don't even know what they're looking at. And if you look for it, I never watched the royal wedding, but it took place in Westminster again, just like the Queen was coronated in. I saw the coronation on uh, old reruns. And what you're seeing there is a reenactment of even a system they used in ancient e- Egypt, uh, and even the, the, the system of Nimrod. Nimrod was a guy who wore uh, the, the mottled fur around his neck. It was, it was white with black spots like the royalties do today. Uh, and, um, and, and he sat too on a, a raised dais, a sort of form of pyramid. And everybody that you'll see around that throne is standing in the same positions you'll see carved in the old steelers of, of ancient Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East. So you're watching on, and you wonder what, what on earth is that, that is. they're doing this in England. What's that got to do with the English? It's got nothing to do with the English. Uh, so this is a very secretive society. Everything must be done properly. They don't make it up on the spot. You'll stand here with this big scepter and you'll, stand, you'll hand it to so-and-so. This is all from ancient books. And you're watching the dominance of an ancient system still work through, take over the world today. Yeah. All right. Well, I won't take any more of your time. Cheers, mate. Keep up the good work, then. Thanks for calling. And we've got Anthony from New York City as well, if Anthony's there. Oh, yeah. Hello. This Hello. Hello. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Alan. Um, I had a qu- you spoke about population reduction uh, today in the program, and I just had a question about the um, uh, the Georgia Guidestones. Yeah. And um, uh, apparently they have ten laws. All of each are, are um, written in English, Swahili, Spanish, Hindi, Hebrew, 
Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. And he also spoke about with the previous caller about the ancient orders. They also have some languages here also in Babylonian, classical mm -hmm. Greek, Sanskrit, and ancient Egyptian. Yeah. Did those um, um, ancient orders speak those languages, and did they have their secret brotherhood in those time periods and in those cultures? And um, could you just expound upon um, the, the Ten Laws here? That seems like a mockery of the Ten Commandments um, yeah. on the um, uh, George, Georgia Guidestones. Yeah. They've always used uh, their own uh, ancient languages and the very high orders amongst themselves. That Because obviously even if someone could spy on you, which is, there's obviously no hope of doing with the security that they have, but they, they have, uh, in case anybody did, they wouldn't know what they were talking about, basically. But it's also a symbol of all of the ancient brotherhoods coming together, because they were all of one brotherhood in ancient times. It doesn't matter what language they spoke. So they'd have high lodges in every city-state, which were actually countries in those days. And, uh, and so they came down through the ages. They, they actually were scattered at one point, thousands of years ago. They admit that themselves. Uh, there's Sam's that were taken out of the Old Testament for Christians, which are still available in the Jewish text, where it talks about them um, and how they, they had their own particular um, ceremonies. They went underground, meaning inside caves or down under the earth for these ceremonies. And they, they had these forms of orgies, the kind that you saw in one of the Matrix movies where, where they were going to have this kind of strange dance very, very paganistic uh, sexual dance that was all symbolic of that ancient system. Anyway, it says eventually that they wanted to, they, they pushed so far, taking over countries and peoples and so on, the people rebelled when they found out what they're up to. They give Nimrod as an example, uh, and uh, they, they, they hunted them down all over the deserts. Wherever they found them, they killed them. And when they started up again, these guys obviously used the same old passwords and symbols and handshakes and waves and, and winks and nods and so on, and the way they stand with their feet. Even Isaiah talks about it in one, one, one verse, where they stand and wink, you know. And um, uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll find uh, that uh, they've come down through time, uh, rebuilding that which was lost, as they claim. And what was lost was a complete domination of an ancient world, all trade, all banking, all armies, all everything. Uh, where most of the people were being turned into slaves in all their city-states. That was how they ran Greece. That's how they ran Rome. That's how they're running the world. People don't realize that there's wage slaves, uh, and now you don't need a slave master to, to throw a rag at you or a pair, of, a pair of sandals once in a while. You buy it yourself with a little you're left over. So we're, we're not as poor as those ancient ones, but we're getting to that stage. We will get to that stage by the time we're done. And they plan the future, as they say. They, are the, they represent the gods, the, the god of the world. The god of the world blesses you in all, all your endeavors. Uh, you want power, fame, fortune. You join the brotherhood, and they'll make sure that, if, that you get it uh, if you serve them in a certain direction. So uh, he's a demiurgos, as they say, the bad-tempered god, the one who can be nice at one minute, bad the next. So... Again, he's got the two hands, he's got the olive branch, and he's got the, he's got the, the symbol of the, the arrows in the other. That's the symbol of Manasseh as well, and a long history to Manasseh, who they claim was a, the descendants of uh, Joseph, not the other uh, tribes. And that's why they use the Egyptian symbology so much in the U.S., for instance. That's why Rothschild has that on his crest as well. So it's a long, long story, but if you go into the history of Ephod, well, an ephod as well, it was an eye. It could also be called a basket, but it was also an eye in ancient Hebrew and Aramaic. And you'll find the, the verse in Isaiah where you talk about the, the, those that be careful of those who wink and stand with their, their feet squared, basically, together, as they do in the military in Britain, for instance. And that's why they call it square bashing, too, in the way you stand at attention. Aten was the god at that time. So... Uh, it's interesting, it all ties together, it can't be refuted, um, and yet it's nothing you can take into a court of law, because the law is also their system, the legal system is theirs too. And they're recreating that which they lost, which is their total dominance over the world, to run the world the, the way that they themselves, being high intellectuals, as they believe they are, have the right to rule it. And uh, they use democracy as a front, which is such a joke, because we have no rights at all in democracy. 
Can, can you go into the Georgia Guidestone and, and explain what, what is the, what is the reason for those ten laws and what what, what uh, who put that there? And well, we, we know that a Mason definitely put it there, a Rosicrucian, and even the name that was given supposedly on the county records of the guy who purchased that little bit of land there and so on was was a, a, again I think Christian Rosencrutz used <laughs> from the Rosy Cross, you know. So uh, that's a very uh, so that's obviously Masonic. Um, the, the, the true Rosy Cross, there's two in the U.S. One's a fake, one's a real one. But uh, they do believe the same things I've just been telling you, that the, the, the super intelligent uh, have the rights, uh, those, and those who are rich and powerful and who have not married out of lust but, but allowed the priests to match them up with the proper women of the right qualities. Uh, and that's very important. In fact, the gene often comes through the female lineage, not the male. Uh, but they, they say that um, they, they want to reduce the population down to their manageable level that they wanted in ancient times and recreate the ancient times where they would live high on the hog in their big marble cities and the few peasants will simply farm the land. Uh, that's what they claim. But I'll, I'll speak a bit more when I come back from this break on that. Hi folks, we're back cutting through the matrix talking to Anthony from New York. Who was talking about the Georgia Guidestones, and and uh, there's no doubt about it, they've been defaced already by folk who've woken up and <laughs> rather object to the fact that, that these guys want to kill them off, and quite rightly so. Uh, but uh, the, the, the ten laws again um, go back to, uh, to very ancient times. Uh, uh, on the one hand, it, it's a symbol of hermaphroditic systems or power. Uh, uh, left brain, right brain, all the rest of it, male, female. Uh, the one is a male, and of course they don't like females too much except for the gene they carry and their ability to reproduce uh, their, from their own sperm, obviously. Um, and so it's, uh, it's also, that, that zero is a female. And if you read it backwards too, it's from 10, it's the net. They love the word net. They've got lots to do with net and Poseidon and so on. So they've given a lot of symbology there for their owns to read. Their own ones to read, and I think most of these guidestones stand on four pillars or so. That's traditional, at least. And the four pillars are four squared. That means perfected. Uh, the perfect um, ashlar basically is is four squared, and all all masons are said to be ashlars. They become perfectly squared on all sides. In other words, so they're not just normal anymore. Normal and ignorant or profane, like a rolling stone, right? They become squared and perfected by the system and the lodge. And that's what that means too. All those who've been perfected will survive. Uh, the, the other ones will be destroyed by what they call the law of nature, and the fittest should go on. But um, y- y- you'll find this traditionally through all. If you know how to read Freemasonic writing, uh, you, you'll find it through all their talks. They're very seductive, by the way. So try as, as all these books are written uh, with with two uh, uh, two systems combined into one. One's exoteric, one's esoteric. The exoteric can tend to put you to sleep. Uh, the esoteric, if you keep awake, you'll, you'll see the thread of what they're actually saying, but almost between the lines, as they guide your mind. And it captures some people, and they become willing recruits. So when you read their stuff, you have to be awfully, awfully careful and not to be trapped by it, because they use a lot of truths, and then combine it with their, their very careful spin that they've worked out over thousands of years to be very successful, and then you're, you're gone. Uh, you'll be one of theirs, on a low level, obviously, because you won't have the right genealogy. So these guys all claim to be at least a third generation of perfect uh, breeding. That means their wives were picked for them. The son uh, goes higher than the father. The, the grandson goes even higher. He can go, start off at a very high degree at a much younger age and, and taught. He's the perfect one that they're after, the third generation of perfect breeding. So it's a very, very old system. It's in your face, of course. Uh, Jacques Cousteau and all these guys, the guys who loved nature and wanted to kill off the public, uh, all belong to the same organization. And as I say, each branch of it is a specialized branch in its own area. And so you have Rosicrucianism, you have General Freemasonry. You have, this, again, what, look to see what parallel it's on. It's very important. They love the 33rd degree as well. And you'll see that's where they dropped the, the bomb on Japan, was in the 33rd degree parallel. They love that one so so much that for the 33rd degree, because that's where the sun goes down, you see, and uh, rises on the 30th, and then sets on the 33rd. 
So they give you these stories of the, your lumen period, and you have to achieve lots of things by the time you're 30 to, to at least 33. Uh, for the lower masons, they can get their 32nd degree and a little badge and a little gold uh, watch to wear and all that stuff. But that's the lower masonry. They're the they're, they're lower lodge, as Albert Pike called them, the lesser lodge. They're a, basically a front, as most people in religions are a front for a higher system and don't know it. Scottish writer for your masonry is not Scottish. You speak it. You've got, you've got seraphim. Seraphim is the higher order of angels. Uh, that's it for tonight, folks. From Hamish Marcel from Ontario, Canada, it's good night to me. Your God or your God's go with you. There's Alan from Scotland. It's a long-distance call hanging on there. Are you there, Alan? Hello. Hi there. It's, it's Adam, actually. It's obviously the Scottish accent. It's confused them. Um, it's confused them. Okay, that's right. Um, yeah. I've actually, I've, obviously, it's a pleasure to speak to you, Alan, as usual. Um, I've got a question on the, the hierarchy of this elite. I mean, yeah. it's obvious um, there's certainly an elite that's, that's running the show. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about that, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, it's, it's not conditioned. You can see that. Mm-hmm. I've got a question on the, the hierarchy of the elite. Yeah. Um, do you think that the top of this elite is, is the heads of these world banking families? They're definitely, closer to the, they're, they're definitely closer to the top. And you, you can find evidence uh, that in Frankfurt, for instance, in the, in the 1700s, and then later in the 1800s, uh, the top banks, uh, bankers there uh, and moneylenders for, for the nations did have a club and they had their meetings. They elected their own uh, chairman by themselves and so on. And they did decide the future naturally because they dealt with all economies. They, they were deciding the future then of countries and, and deliberating who they should fund for war. Would, if this country lost, could they pay back their debts and so on? Well, it's never really changed. So whenever you get e- economics and money and, all, and, and borrowing, you're always going to have the same bunch at the top. And they definitely are interbred, though. There's no doubt about it. And if they're not the top, they're cl- much closer to it. They, they have to be. Um, there's so much perfect um, coordination between all the factors that create society as we know it today and, and shape the generations that are coming out of university now with all their greening. They're, they truly are fanatical now. They've been radicalized. Uh, and they're all ready for the collectivist society and the total socialist system. So it's so perfect. There's definitely a, a, a big hierarchy. But there's also so many think tanks working at the top, and each think tank has its own specialist area. And then they all come together at the United Nations and all the different departments, and then all the countries sign the agreements and put it into law, all from education to everything, from economics to education. So it's so incredibly vast, um, You'll never know exactly who is behind it. Sometimes they give little clues away about the clubs that are higher up there. Uh, Prince Charles has call, called himself at one time, uh, mind you, a lot of crazy things as well, but not surprised from him. But he did say uh, he belonged, he was one of the Olympians. Now, the Olympians, as you know, were the gods of uh, ancient Greece. And they used uh, the, the Olympian club uh, is a very high uh, high art membership society that certainly has a lot of input in running the world even today. Uh, these are very rich families, very old genealogies, and they're definitely up there, but perhaps not at the top of the tree. But they're they're closer to it. I don't think you'll ever see the real people in public. They'll be incredibly rich. Um, every top politician or, or prime minister or president will know their names. But you'll never, I don't think you'll ever find their names in the newspapers. They don't work. They don't work. They make suggestions. And all the little minions beneath them run to it, make sure things are done. But they never actually give orders as such. When you see a Rockefeller attending world meetings, he's still working. So even though he's high on the hog and he's pushing all the socialist agendas, um, transhumanism, everything, transsexualism, the whole lot, kit and caboodle, um, he's still a worker, basically. Uh, so you can imagine how these guys at the top really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that, that seems to be the case. And uh, any time you see any United Nations or any kind of think tanks, there's always the same, as far as I can see, the same families that are controlling that. But obviously I don't know who's absolutely yes. the peak. As you said, it's probably very difficult to determine that. The, 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 the big trick, the big trick more, too... Oh, well, yeah, the big trick as well is to follow both lineages, the, 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 the male lineage and the female lineage. And uh, that's what confuses us, us, not to them, because they have their own little clubs that have their lineages and keep it all in order for them. Uh, they all know who they are. 
but uh, as I say, you have to get both lineages to find out exactly who they are, and and any name changes at all as well. And they can also adopt certain ones into their families, as the Rothschilds have done as well. Uh, but hang on, I'll be back after this break. Hi, folks, we're back, and we're cutting through the matrix. Is Alan still on the line, or Adam, I should say, from Scotland? Is he still there? Oh, yeah. Yes. I was going to say, too, another thing to notice, too, Scotland, you'd be surprised at the amount of uh, people have come out of Scotland um, and uh, done a lot of meddling with this world order. I mean, the University of Aberdeen has always been one of the, leaders, the, the leading uh, universities for communism and socialism for the world, you know. And the whole idea of solidarity was invented by those guys. And then you find this other odd thing, too, is that, you know, the royal family in London, uh, they always have their cup bearers and special bearers for this and so on. Well, it's always been a Scotsman, the, the, the Campbell family, Lord Campbell, who've been in charge uh, of the Great Seal of England. They carry the Great Seal of England for the English. Uh, no one's ever explained this, this strange um, uh, relationship of certain families, and even from countries that you think are outside of the main country, uh, that there are actually characters in places like Scotland that have more power than, than most of the English. Uh, it's never, ever been explained. Yeah. Absolutely. And as far as I can see, for such a small country, um, the amount of corruption in this country over the years is incredible for the size of the country. It's obviously it's tied in big time to the, the, the elite families of the day, and there's no doubt about that. But obviously the working class is obviously different. We're not aware of that. They're not aware at all. They, they don't even know in Argyllshire where the Campbells are. That's Lord Campbell again. Uh, you have those, these Templar graves all over the place because when they escaped from France, that's where they went. And so the Knights Templars were big. Of course, they were the big bankers of their day. And that's where, that's where the word check comes from. They, they gave out the first checks uh, back in the 11th century and 12th centuries. They gave out checks in lieu of money. And because they, they planned, like the H. Checker, there was a chess board outside, a checkerboard outside in the city of London. That's where they did all their financial arrangements, debt and, and, and profit and so on. And uh, that's why they called it a check. And that's why we spell it in, in Britain differently from America. It's actually from checker, checkerboard, yeah. So they settled in, the, in the, the highlands there, in the western highlands, and they always took the sides of, of a united Britain. Uh, they always went against all the rest of the Scots. Uh, and uh, the Lord Campbells. So it's interesting that they're, they're definitely high, way up high in the tree there and intermarried with a lot of uh, other foreign bigwigs in other countries as well. And, and Scotland also gave them the Bank of England. You know, It was a Scotsman that came down from Calendar and uh, uh, created the whole idea of the Bank of England. And then, of course, they just sat and waited until Rothschild came along and took it over. But the Scotsman set it up for them. Then another Scotsman was sent over to France, and that created the French bubble by doing the same thing there, uh, by creating a bank for for France as well. So there's always been this this amazing secret society stuff within Scotland. Uh, the Knights Templar, and then later on down through the years, you have the, 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 the Masons coming forward, of course. And um, it, it's definitely all tied together somehow, yeah. That's incredible. I, I realised that was, most of that was true. I didn't realise that the check part you were saying that was that's incredible. Actually, it originated there. That's what originated. Yeah, yeah. The Templars used to take in the gold, the gold coin, and so on. Even had the Treasury of England. They, they were in charge of, of taking it in, in their own little uh, special place where they, were, they guarded it. And you could go to the Middle East. They give you a check, literally a check. Uh, because, they, as I say, they did it on the open-air chessboard. It was a big thing. They used poles and pushed these checkers along the black and white squares. And they give you a check and say that's where your money is now, symbolizing their vault. And they give you a check in lieu and you took it to the Middle East and then you cashed it in there. <laughs> that, yeah, that's incredible. I had no idea that was the case. I had absolutely no idea. And that's why you got the Chancellor of the H. Checker. And the, and the English don't know it. The English don't know it. But I mean, what, they've never, never asked why the actual English flag is actually uh, a, it's a red cross. Yeah, yeah is that? That's it's a Templar cross. Yeah. I had absolutely no idea that was the case, to be honest with you. Uh, one more quick question, Alan, if that's okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll take the answer off the air. Um, it's to do with the, the Scottish Freemasonry. Yeah. I've read some books. I don't know if they're true or, or misinformation or disinformation or plain like lies, but I've heard that the Knights Templar, um, once they were obviously cast out of France, come over to Scotland and established the Scottish Rate of Freemasonry. We know it's not really Scottish. We know that, but... Is that how it formed? And also, is the 33rd degree really the highest rank? Obviously, it is in the public, 
point of view, but is that really the highest rank? No. Uh, uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry isn't Scottish. It actually is. A, it was given a charter by the Grand Orient Lodge of France. Uh, France, mind you, was given their charter by uh, the English Grand Lodge. So, but it, it really came from France, and it was a more atheistic uh, system than, than the English Lodge. They're all, they're all pals together, of course, but um, it was atheistic, and it was definitely socialistic or communistic in its whole, uh, from, from the very beginning. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was a member of it, uh, but they called it the Scottish Rite of Freemasons because... Uh, and it, it, was, it didn't start off in Scotland either. The French sent a, a guy over to the USA, and he ended up in Charleston, South Carolina. And eventually they created the lodge there, and Albert Pike took it over, the, the actual great lodge for the Scottish Rite of Freemasons, and they spread it across the world from the USA. But it's not Scottish at all. In fact, most, a lot of the Scots are actually members of the English Grand Lodge. Yeah. Yeah, I know that for a fact, actually. That's true. Um, that, that's incredible. I don't actually know what books to read and what books not to read because there's so much disinformation and actual lies as well. I don't know what to read, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, there's so much tripe put out there. I mean, modern Freemasonry broke out in the 1700s. Now, there's always been the secret societies uh, all down through the ages. Whenever you get rich men coming together, they always make the little society secret uh, because they get rich by doing other folk in and, and uh, profiting off, in, off of misadventure or wars and things. So they create secret societies. But we do know that uh, the Templars were in Scotland by the evidence that was left behind, especially in Argyllshire, uh, with the Templar graves and so on. And it's even thought they went over to the Americas, which I wouldn't be surprised if, it, if that isn't true. Uh, but they never did find their treasure. They had their own fleet, fleet of ships uh, when they sailed out of France. And uh, Philip the Fair was after them, of course. Uh, because they were taking over massive uh, landed estates. When knights died off, uh, they would send out their emissaries to try to talk to the widow, and she would often sign over the lands to the Templars. They were taking over huge chunks of Scandinavia, Scotland, England, uh, and the rest of Europe, and paying no taxes, and they, financially they were becoming an incredibly powerful force to be reckoned with. Their symbol, when they went, when they went on the sea, uh, changed when we were cast out of France uh, to the skull and bones, the pirate flag. Yeah. 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 I think that's incredible. Absolutely incredible. But you, have to be, you have to be careful, as I say. Uh, remember, too, whatever the Masons will, will put out themselves, even in their own books, has multiple. they'll have multiple meanings and often a lot of lies in it themselves because um, the, the true secrets of Masonry are kept in, in higher Freemasonry. They don't care about the low stuff. Uh, the higher Freemasons. Why do you think it's so secretive? You know, uh, I mean, the, under, behind, if they're really a charitable institution, why do you have to have secrets kept from the public? Well, it's, 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 charity is just a front. And uh, but what you, you do know is it helps you get up the ladder. And every darn politician in Britain generally is a member of, of Freemasonry. It gets them up there, and then they can start scamming off the public purse, and nobody will. will, will uh, clipe on them because they stand up, they're, they're vowed to stand up for a brother, even in a court. So you have these born liars, basically, or at least they can initiate liars, put it that way, and they, they run the darn system from top to bottom. And you, ha- you pretty well have to be a member almost in Scotland to get anywhere in the system. Absolutely, Alan. You've, you've nailed it again, but I'll certainly... I'll certainly look into a lot more than that. As I say, I can't read too much because there's, there's so much disinformation. I'll, I'll try and put a link up tonight to a series that was put out in Britain. It's on the internet, I think, uh, on Freemasonry. Uh, and it shows you, yeah, yeah, you'll see all the scams at the pool and all the different county councils and so on. And it's just amazing. And the cops too, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I would, I would, I would appreciate that. Uh, thanks very much for your, for your help, Alan, as usual. It's a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, thanks for calling.